So um, today I'm going to be talking about developing with .NET Core using Rider on AWS. Quite a long title. Also another long title is my, my job title. It's a Principal Developer Advocate at AWS Developer Relations. Um, my name is Martin Beebe. Um, today we're going to be covering um, three main things really. So how you can build things in AWS. We're going to look at the different ways in which you can build infrastructure in AWS. Um, obviously we're going to be focusing very much on Rider. But I want to give you an overview about how you would do it generally or the other ways that you could do it as well. Then we're going to build a serverless app um, using Rider. Um, then we're going to build a container based app using Rider. Um, what we're not going to be showing today, and it was mentioned in the um, abstract, so I thought I'd mention it, is we're not going to be talking about migrating existing .NET applications. However, the techniques that I'm using today are the same ones or similar ones as the ones that we'd show you how to migrate applications. Um, there is actually a workshop that I'll link to at the end of this, which goes through a detailed um, modernization and shows some migration techniques as well. So um, I'll be introducing basically the concepts of how to build on AWS with Rider, and um, then give you an opportunity to take it further if you want to migrate existing applications, or maybe if you just want to start building applications um, greenfield. Um, so I'm Martin Beebe, this is, this is me. This is one of my most important slides on my entire deck, and I'm not sure if this is gonna be work, work, but we're gonna try. It's called an inception slide. If you have a camera, please take a picture of this slide. Uh, it's quite important for me, because you see on the, uh, on the uh, image above there, um, that's a picture of me standing in front of a slide, 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 front of a, slide um, a number of times. Uh, I think I'm now at 45 different times. Um, so it's quite an important slide. So if someone takes a picture and tweets it to me at the Beebs with a hashtag inception, that would be wonderful. If not, I'll just go back and get the video. I'll do it myself, I guess. Um, so um, I've been a software developer since I was 16 years old. Um, I uh, have been a developer uh, now for 20 years, which is a shocking amount of time. Um, and I work here at Amazon Web Services. I previously worked at, uh, at Microsoft. Um, for uh, eight years as an evangelist and also as a software development engineer. Um, and my Twitter handle is at the Beebs. I'll be sending some, um, some tweets uh, throughout this session. Um, so I'll, for example, just send this one now, the inception slide to my uh, Twitter. Uh, there we go. Hopefully that will have been sent when I click that. Well, it's taking its time. I've got a little indicator in the background saying, there we go, it says it's been sent. So hopefully on my Twitter account now, that, that, you, that link will be sent. And that's kind of important because the application I'm gonna build later on is actually using that send tweet uh, functionality. So that's one of the serverless Lambda functions that, we'll do, that I'll show you in this, uh, this uh, uh, session. So uh, let's talk about AWS. Now, I was pretty new to AWS when I started about a year and a half ago. I'd used other cloud providers, but hadn't really used AWS. And I, I went to the console, which is actually the website, but people at AWS call it a console. Um, that website, that console, um, has an array of services. And it can be quite um, scary when you look at them all. You know, there's, there's plus upwards of 165 different services at AWS. Um, going from basic ones like compute ones like EC2, uh, which are in the uh, over there in the compute section, uh, to things like um, uh, crazy things like satellite ground station. Like if you want to create a ground station for satellites, then we have a service for that. Um, and it can be a bit bewildering and, and, and disorientating to, to say, well, how do I get started? What am I going to do? Now, one of the simplest things that you can do is just click around this console and you can create most of the infrastructure directly from the website. So if you're into that, then you can do that. So one of the most straightforward things in AWS to create is a thing called a bucket. So an S3 bucket, it's a place where we store things. So if you want to store images, if you want to create a static website, if you wanted to create a um, video storage, um, S3 would be the service that you'd probably be looking at. And thousands and thousands of companies use S3 uh, to share documents, to uh, share images, to use images on their websites, all sorts of things, highly scalable um, uh, storage service. Um, so the console for S3 looks a bit like this. Um, you create these things called buckets and uh, you can do it through the UI, UI. You can create a bucket, give it a name, and then it's available. And it can either be public or not public and parts of it can be different public and they can be encrypted or it can be unencrypted. There's lots of different features to it. None of that's really important for what I'm talking about, but we could create it in the console. That's one option. The other option is we could create it at command line. So we have an AWS command line interface 
all the APIs in AWS are available and you can start creating stuff there. So to do that, I'd go into terminal and I'd type in or command line, a command prompt and say AWS S3 make bucket MB uh, S3 colon slash slash demo dash jet brains dash dot net days. Uh, and then I could optionally give it a region that I want it to create in. Um, we have many different regions, uh, uh, over 22 different regions in AWS. I say I want it in, in EU West one and the make bucket command then goes and creates me an S3 bucket. And I could then go and upload stuff from the command line if I wanted to, um, or I could go into the console and see that bucket and upload stuff there. Um, now I've created a bucket in two different ways. Well, there's, there's more than two different ways. There's many, many different ways. Another one for .NET developers, sometimes you have um, some PowerShell skills. So we have a whole array of PowerShell uh, libraries that you can use to uh, interact with AWS. Um, and basically, to, to install with, with PowerShell, I'd go into a PowerShell command, and I would, um, this is obviously installing the uh, module that I'm going to need. Oh, this is a one-off thing that I'm going to do. So install the module AWS Tools Installer. And then I'm going to install a specific module, so the S3 module, because I want to work with S3 buckets. And then I can just issue a new S3 bucket command, give it a name, give it a region, and it will then go and create my uh, PowerShell uh, S3 bucket, the bucket that I, I created. So now I've got three different ways of creating a bucket. That's great. There's, there's, there's more. Um, if you're not much of a command line person, uh, and I'm not particularly, um, you could use something like the AWS Cloud Development Kit. And this allows you to create infrastructure using your favorite language. So you can use um, Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, um, but more importantly, you can use C Sharp. And so you can actually also use PowerShell for this as well, but we're not going to show you that. Um, but in um, the, this Cloud Development Kit works roughly like this. We go and create a little application. It's got a formula to creating. We'll, we'll do one of these a little bit later. And I'm saying I want to create this one line on line 16 says new bucket and I'm giving a bucket name. I execute that application and it creates a thing called a cloud formation change set, which is basically um, some infrastructure uh, uh, a document. It deploys that um, to AWS and then it will create my bucket for me. And um, that's another way that we could maybe interact with AWS. And so uh, to deploy that application, I do actually use a little bit of command line. I say CDK deploy and it deploys anything in that stack. Now I'm only creating a bucket there, but I could have any piece of AWS infrastructure in that stack and it could go and create that for me. Um, we have a toolkit for Visual Studio Code. Um, so if you're a Visual Studio Code user, you could use that. Um, we have a toolkit for Visual Studio. So it's a sort of built into the IDE. And of course we have what we're gonna be talking about today, which is the AWS toolkit for Rider. And what the idea of these toolkits is, is that it gives you sort of access to some of the more commonly used um, um, services, not all of the services, but some of the commonly used ones that .NET developers are going to be interested in. Um, so the AWS toolkit for Rider isn't set up for all kinds of .NET development. It's really um, set up for serverless application development using, using .NET. So I'll show you a little bit about that, but then Rider is still a great way of working with AWS. And so with combina in combination with the CDK, uh, the Cloud Development Kit and Rider, that's kind of how I work and how I operate and how I build uh, infrastructure. So um, I'm going to go over here and just show you with the toolkit for, for Rider how we install that. So you would go over to the, um, the plugins uh, section on Rider and search for AWS. There's an AWS toolkit. I've already got it installed but you would click that, install the toolkit, and then you have the part, the plugin inside of Rider that you'll need. However, um, there are going to be another few things that you're going to need. Um, one is you're going to need the AWS command line interface because actually there is some interaction between that's how it actually ends up getting to AWS. So you'll need the, the command line interface or the CLI installed. Um, you'll need that in part to be able to do the authorization. Um, and to be able to log into your account and so forth. Now, the rider is going to help you with that author authentication, but actually under the hood, it's using the CLI. Um, you're going to need Docker. Um, Docker is going to be required because when you're testing or building or debugging your serverless applications, we can't always do that in the cloud. You might be on a train um, working without internet connectivity. So we have um, a way of debugging serverless applications using um, Docker. So the whole concept of, of the way that we build service applications is, is based upon Docker. 
And so um, you need Docker to be running in the background to be able to at least to, to, be, uh, to, to debug serverless applications if that's what you want to do. And then you'll need to have a thing called the AWS um, serverless application model command line interface installed. Uh, and once you've got those four things set up, um, you're good to go. I'm going to just go and click this send tweet. It's going to go and tweet out um, a link to uh, the installation for Rider. Uh, so here's a link for how to install AWS Toolkit for Rider and the uh, link to how we get it installed on my Twitter account. So it's at the Beebs, by the way, if you are interested in uh, getting that link. So um, once we have that installed, there's a few things that you'll change about Rider. Now, we have um, this thing, uh, this new, um, I don't know what the, 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 spe the specific name is um, in, in the parlance of, of, of Rider, but it's kind of the AWS Explorer, which is like a tab on the left-hand side. We click open that, and you'll see that um, I have a number of different services. I've got CloudFormation, CloudWatch, Logs, ECS, Lambda, S3, and Schemas. Um, CloudFormation, that is a service um, which allows you to create infrastructure as code. We have CloudWatch, which is like our logging um, service. We have ECS, which is the Elastic Container Service, which is where you would um, push containers and run container services, um, uh, container workloads, sorry. We have Lambda, which is where we run serverless applications. We have S3, which is um, the storage uh, service that I talked about earlier. And then there's schemas, which I'll not go into at the moment. It's not that important for, for what we're, we're looking at. Now, we have those services. Uh, services which are available to us and we I'm logged into my account uh, at the moment you'll see on the uh, on the bottom uh, of the ooh, I can't really show you that oh, it says over here the AWS profile the Beebs Europe uh, I'm logged in uh, to that account that's why that AWS Explorer is showing me that information um, if you're not logged in it will it will prompt you to choose the correct account and we'll look at that a little bit later um, so let's just look at the S3 service quickly if I uh, look at the S3, I've got a number of buckets in my account. I've got the uh, demo jetbrains.net uh, days one. I've got the demo PowerShell S3 bucket. Um, and I've got a few other different buckets that are needed. I could um, actually from, from Rider go create a bucket if I wanted to. So I could right click on S3 and put in a name of a bucket. And then I can upload an image once that bucket's been created. I just want to say thank you very much for everyone which uh, tweeted me the inception picture. There was loads of you. So that was amazing. Thank you very much. And then there's a really uh, goofy picture of me uh, uploaded to my S3 bucket. So that's kind of like S3, uh, a very simple, uh, you know, in, in showing you how you can use that service from within Rider, which is which is kind of cool. But let's probably want to do a little bit more. So we probably want to create something like a, a serverless application. Now we have a serverless application uh, framework uh, service called Lambda. So um, Lambda um, started off is this concept of you know you generate a small piece of code uh, and you write it in what pretty much whatever language you like. Um, I'll write mine in .NET, for example. I write a small function, and then um, that function then can be triggered by an event. So sometimes that event might be um, um, a, a button being pressed or something happening in my infrastructure or a file being uploaded to an S3 bucket or something being added to an SQS queue. There's lots of different ways that you can trigger a, a, a Lambda function. And you can build lots of different kinds of applications. So you could build web applications um, in the UK, um, Comic Relief or a major charity. All their donation platform is built on top of Lambda. Um, they, uh, you could build backends for websites. You could build real-time data processing using Lambda. You could build chatbots. You could build uh, things for, I don't want to say that name because I have uh, one of those uh, devices, but an Amazon um, uh, device, uh, voice device. The, um, you could you could power the skills using Lambda, and lots of people build the, the skills using Lambda, um, or things like IT automation. You can have things like um, you know if um, 
you could have a lambda which runs on a on a on a cron on a on a schedule and just checks to see if um, firewalls are all the correct ports are closed on a firewall and if they're not or they've been opened it will automatically close them that's a common use case for it automation so building lambdas to kind of do things on schedules and just make sure that certain things are still secure or, or whatnot so there's loads of reasons why you want to use a lambda um, let's go and create a file new uh, serverless application now i say serverless application not just a serverless function you can just create one function but we have this concept called um, sam the serverless application model and it means a serverless application is usually consists of more than one function. So you might have like six or seven functions and a DynamoDB database and a, an API gateway and all of the connections between those different functions set up as a sort of an application set. And uh, we have this concept of modeling that using uh, a thing called SAM uh, or serverless application model. And it basically means, you know, all the different things which make up your service application, because rarely do service applications of any scale use just one single function. So um, we're going to just build one single function just to show you the concept, but it should be noted that you can build much more complicated applications than, than just simple ones. So um, if we go to file new project and uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see if I've got the, the, the toolkit installed, I have AWS serverless application. I can choose my .NET Core environment. I'm gonna use 3.1 and I'm just gonna leave everything else uh, blank and it will just generate this SAM template, serverless application model template for me. Um, I've got a readme, but I'm too cool to read a readme, so I'm just gonna close that. And then I have got a function.cs, which is where my Lambda function sits. And this is the entry point, point really for my function. This async task uh, is my function handler. And it's set up at the moment to receive uh, something from uh, an API gateway and um, it's got, it calls a function called get uh, calling API uh, IP, which gets the uh, IP address of the requester. It then just responds, it basically echoes that back as a message. And this is where a Lambda can just basically send a, a 200 response um, and a piece of JSON back to the re requester. Um, I've got a, um, a test project in here. Now this test project basically sets up a, a Lambda uh, uh, function it sets out the expected response, and then it creates that function, um, that class, and then basically calls that function handler, and then does some ugly console write lines. And then it basically asserts whether what it got back was what it expected. Now, when it's doing this, um, when it's calling, you know, when it's using this, uh, this test harness, we're just basically exercising the class. We're not exercising it really. Like this is it just the, making sure that our classes do what we expect. So those are what those unit tests are doing, but we're not testing it in the sort of as an actual serverless um, um, thing. That's where Sam comes in and we'll look at that later. But if we wanted to execute those tests, we could absolutely run those unit tests just by clicking on the project, just like you would do with any uh, regular project, run the unit tests and it will run um, some unit tests for that particular um, function handler. So we're good that we're all green, we're all ticked. It shows that we've, we've got it working roughly as we expect. So um, next I wanna run um, using a thing called this, the service application model, SAM. I've mentioned this a few times. Um, the cool thing about this is that it's not just a way of modeling your application. It also means that we can run it locally. So if you've got a little DynamoDB database and a couple of functions, it will create them all locally for you. And then you can you know, see how they interact with each other. Um, so if you've got a trigger off an S3 bucket, you know, an image being uploaded and then a Lambda, which processes whatever's been uploaded to S3 bucket, you could model that inside of a service application model, and then you can run it locally and debug it. And it sounds complicated. It really isn't. And I'll explain a little bit about that. So, um, here we have inside the um, uh, if we just press the sorry the the play button, what that's going to do is it's going to run this function, and we're going to pass in like the payload is going to be an API gateway proxy payload. So it's like a JSON file with what's going to be sent to this lambda um, uh, function. Now it's saying that I can't run this because my credentials haven't been set up properly. Um, so I'll just set them up and show you how Rider sets up the credentials. I choose my region that I want, which is Ireland. And then I just choose the profile that I want. I've got two profiles on the machine. I'm just going to use the default profile. 
That's my work account. It's set up to my work AWS account. So I'm going to go and apply that and then run that um, against this, this code. And what it's going to do is it's going to create a version locally of my um, Lambda function. It's going to then send that proxy request to that SAM build, that, 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 that um, payload to that function. And then the function is going to um, process. Um, so it starts, the function starts. There's the response from my function, and then the, the request ends. And you'll see it says hello world, and it gives an IP address of the um, uh, of the person which called it, or the, the 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 machine which called it. So that's actually much more realistic running my function. So my function just is basically like a console application; it just responds some JSON. Um, but it starts, it responds to JSON, and it ends. And you'll see that it took 2.13 uh 213 milliseconds to run that and it tells you how long it ran and the duration so and the maximum amount of memory that it used um so it's 53 megabytes of memory used in that instance so but that's a much more realistic than what we were testing with before now we could debug this we could put breakpoints in it and all sorts so um we are able to test in a in a production like environment about how our functions are really actually working um, and we can do that all offline without any cloud connectivity so if we want to deploy this function to production. Um, what we will do is we go to this thing called template.yaml. Now this template.yaml is basically the SAM template. This is the model of it. And it explains, like, this is where my functions are. I want to create an API gateway. It's all defined in this function here. And if I right click it and choose deploy serverless application, I can say, I want to create a, a stack. So demo stack, this is like a, um, a, a stack of infrastructure um, and it's a I want to create a stack and deploy it there it's going to ask me for an s3 bucket and this is going to be where it uploads the asset so where it uploads the lambda function before it deploys it into production and eventually it will start deploying that um, it builds all of the functions in C sharp locally it packages them up it ships them off to AWS it starts building the infrastructure because I actually have more than just a function in my application. I have a function and I have a thing called an API gateway sitting in front of that function. That means that I can call it via a URL. So I can call this function via a URL from any app, any other application. So um, I've got an API gateway, which is gonna accept HTTP requests, and then it's gonna proxy those requests to my Lambda function, and it's gonna execute my Lambda function. So in a little while, that's going to start uh, creating. Now, on the bottom side here, what you can see is it being created in a service called CloudFormation. CloudFormation is like um, uh, infrastructure as uh, code. So um, it's actually a bunch of YAML or JSON. Now, it's the, the, the YAML and JSON, the YAML we're using for SAM is much as a cut down version of, of CloudFormation. But under the hood, it's, um, it's creating these, um, these, these stacks in cloud formation. So it said that that's then been created for me and I have my uh, application uh, now ready and live. So all of it's ticked and all of the things which it needed to create have been created. And so now I'm live in production with that particular Lambda. And so you can see I have my Lambda functions in the AWS Explorer, I can actually see them um, there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I can actually go and then run against that Lambda function. But this time I'm not running locally. I'm running this, um, you know, actually physically uh, in the cloud. So it's invoking that Lambda function. See, I say start. And, and it tells me how long the actual function ran for, and then I get the response back from the Lambda function as well. And you'll notice the IP address is different because it was actually called by something physically, well, it's actually been called by my real machine um, uh, up into the cloud uh, rather than inside of a Docker container. So we've got uh, our, our function uh, running. So, um, I did mention that the API gateway, there was an API gateway created as well as a function. So that was defined inside that SAM template. So if you look inside the SAM template, you'll see that um, there's a little bit which says, hello world, type API, properties, path, hello, method, get. So I've got a get method um, on this hello API. 
And it's going to be and create that inside of a thing called API Gateway. So if I go to the console or the website, as you might call it, and I go to the Amazon API Gateway service, I'll find that I've got a demo.NET Days um, API Gateway that's been created for me. Like Sam created that thing for me. Now, <clears throat> what you'll see it's set up at the moment to do is any request that comes into that get method is um, sent to the Lambda proxy via this, this proxy. Now, the reason this, this might look quite complicated, but there's a lot of power here. Now, um, I could stand up an API in API Gateway, and I could have some methods going to Lambda functions. I could have some methods going to container applications. I could have some uh, going on being proxy to existing APIs, which have been built by other people but then consolidate it down into a single API. And that, so that's what, that's what API Gateway Service is all about. And it's the way in AWS that we, we, we if you want to trigger a function or a Lambda function um, mm -hmm. using a, a URL, then you have to put API Gateway in front of it. So what happens here is the uh, Lambda uh, is, is invoked by API Gateway when anyone sends a message to the particular API. So um, you can, configure this like crazy you can do all sorts of clever stuff with um, api gateway but we've just kind of left it really basic um when you publish the api the api by the way is all automatically published with the way that i built sam i've got a, a thing called an, an invoke ur url for that api and i can just then go and call that url and um uh, the call the hello method of that uh, url um, with a get request and it will invoke that particular uh, API. So if I go into Postman, for example, and click on that URL, and then it's like slash prod slash hello, then you'll see I press send and I get a response back message, hello world, location, and it gives me the IP address of, of the sender of the requester. So that's a way that Lambda kind of fundamentally works. Now this is a, this is a, 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 a uh, image which is drawn by a guy called AWS Geek. I don't know why I cut that off, by the way, on the corner. I'm sorry about that. So you can only just see at AWS, it should say at AWS Geek. And um, it kind of is like his little drawing of what AWS Lambda is. But it shows that um, in the middle there, it's got a handful of the ways that you can actually like uh, execute one of those Lambdas. So you can see that he's got API Gateway. That's how we're executing our Lambda. But we could uh, be using all sorts of things like step functions, DynamoDB, Kinesis, S3. When someone uploads an image or a video to S3, it could invoke a Lambda. SQS, which is a queuing service. When someone adds something to a queue, we can process a job directly from the queue using Lambda uh, and all sorts of different ways. Um, I don't know if I've got my camera. Yeah, I think I do. Uh, over here, I've got this thing like an a a AWS IoT button. Uh, you can't really see that because of the lights and it's all white. Uh, and if you click that button just here, poof, it sends a message up into the cloud, which executes my Lambda function. And you can buy these on Amazon for like 20 pounds, um, uh, AWS IoT buttons. And then you press them and they'll execute my functions uh, for me, for example. So there's millions and millions of ways that you could execute a function or a Lambda function. Um, I've got this little system where in my talks, I can uh, click on a button and it sends a tweet. I just want to quickly show you uh, how I built that. <clears throat> so I basically took that sample um, application and I just changed a few things. So in the uh, new, it, new up, when I newed up the class, I just have a little check, which checks an environment variable called stage, whether it's production or not. And I load either a Twitter client or a Twitter mock client. Now, this is kind of like a really poor man's dependency injection, um, but basically it's switching based upon the environmental va variable production, sorry, the environmental variable stage. So if it's either the production, then it's gonna use the real Twitter client. And if it's in development or testing, it's gonna use the mock client. In my SAM template, I add a parameter and I say, okay, I've got a, uh, a parameter called um, stage and it can have either allowed values of development or production. And um, you must set this when you basically deploy the application. Um, now inside of the SAM template, I set up on the function, uh, a variable, an environmental variable, which looks at that parameter and it sets it. So when it deploys this uh, Lambda function, <coughs> excuse me, then um, it's gonna set stage to being whatever the stage variable is. 
So you can see when I run or debug my local application, I can, on the bottom there, it says local invoke arguments. I can override that um, argument and say, well, the stage is currently development. So it will use by default, explicitly be using the mock test client, Twitter client, sorry. When I go to deploy the serverless application, I can change one of the parameters. So here I've changed the stage to production. And when I deploy it, that means my deployed application is going to be using this, um, the production version or the production Twitter client. Um, so my, my function handler is a little bit different. I get up um, uh, anything which is passed in by the query string with the, the ID message. I take that message and that's what I'm going to be tweeting. I then um, get the Twitter client, whatever the Twitter client is, whether it be the mock one or the real one. And I call a dot post Twitter message and I pass the message in it. So that, that's basically a, a function inside that class, which will just post my Twitter message. And then I basically echo out that, um, that Twitter message back to the user, giving a 200 response if it's successful and a 403 if it's been unsuccessful. Um, my Twitter post message is quite straight, straightforward. I won't go into how I'm actually posting on Twitter, but it's really straightforward uh, uh, C sharp code. I'm not using any libraries, I'm just doing it all by creating, constructing an OAuth uh, signature and then posting it via, via the regular Twitter API. Um, I am, the one thing which is interesting though is I'm using again environmental variables to get the consumer key, the consumer secret, the token, the token secret, which are required if I want to go and post via the Twitter API. Um, Again, I've added them as parameters. So I've got a consumer key, a consumer secret, a token, a token secret as parameters in my template. And then I set them up uh, by referencing them when I create the function as environment variables. So I say those, those are var var environmental variables that are available to my application. So the consumer key, consumer secret, token and token secret. Um, so that means when I go to post, use that, that live thing, it's going to be basically pulling those environmental variables um, from my uh, from the environment that it's loaded into. And it's going to be able to then hopefully connect to the API successfully and post a message. When I'm deploying my service application, again, I'm setting that consumer key, consumer secret, token, and token secret when I deploy the application. Now, I'm doing it manually from within Rider, but you'd probably be setting this up to to do this, um, adding these consumer keys and consumer secrets um, in your CI CD pipeline. Um, you could even bring these in from a thing called AWS Secret Manager, where you manage your keys and your secrets. Um, but I'm just basically typing them in when I deploy it uh, locally. Cool thing about Rider is that it remembers this information uh, subsequently. So if you if you set these at once, then um, you don't have to set it after time you want to deploy or you know make a change, or whatever. The other thing is I've set up a an API. I'm making an addition to the kind of the default uh, serverless application model, and I just added this auth API key required and set it to true. And what that means is that unless someone supplies an API key, it won't actually work because I don't want anyone to just be able to post directly to my Twitter account. So I'm going to create a, a basic author, authorization um, with uh, an API key, and in the API gateway service, you can create an API key for your particular API. So here I've just created a, a, a demo customer key. And then we can create a thing called a usage plan. And this, the idea of a usage plan, if you want to sell your API, you could have like a basic API, you could have a standard API, you can have a premium API. Um, you can associate different API keys with different usage plans. And then you can give the usage plans different like abilities. So this one says, I'm allowed 10 um, requests per second with a 10 burst. Um, you can say, you know, there's a quota of only allowing 300 requests a month or a million requests a month or however many. You set it up in these usage plans. You assign the uh, um, API keys to the usage plans, and then you can dish these out to customers who can then use your API, and uh, you can sell your API. You can actually sell your API from here as well. If you switch onto that marketplace, you could. No one's going to want to buy an, an API which can tweet only to my AWS account. But if you had an API which you wanted to sell, um, then you could do that through here. So now in Postman, if I want to post to that particular API, I can do that, but I have to uh, pass over a, a key. Um, okay, so that's cool and it seems to work. But let's say uh, I've got a, uh, 
my containers. Hold on, wait, wait me one second. Thank goodness. I just had a little a heart attack there where I looked at that screen and thought, oh my gosh, um, that's basically given out um, a URL of a production workload and uh, an API key, which anyone could just pick out from a video and use. Um, I did luckily make this a fake key. You'll see that on the corner, so that key doesn't work. So if you did try and execute that, you wouldn't be able to directly uh, pass to my uh, my uh, Twitter account. Whew, thank God that I was uh, slightly slightly uh, uh, prepared. Um, but then, um, so if you post that API uh, with that API key, now that will then be able to post. And if you don't provide the API key to that URL, then it won't be, the API will just won't work. And obviously it's, it's adhering to the quotas that you set up in the usage thing as well. So that's kind of like a serverless application. We created it pretty straightforwardly. Um, they can be much more complicated than that, but that's how I created a simple one. Now let's look at um, something like containers inside of uh, kind of um, uh, Rider. Now I'm gonna be using um, uh, a service called AWS Fargate. It's a, a launch. Uh, I realize I'm saying so many different names of services. Um, I apologize for that. Basically, I'm gonna use a service which runs a container. There's, a, there's three ways you can run containers in AWS. You can use Amazon ECS, Amazon EKS, or AWS Fargate. Um, Amazon a EKS, the middle one, that is the Kubernetes service. So we're not gonna look at that today, but you could quite easily do the same sort of things I'm doing here using that. The one on the left is Amazon ECS, this is where you run container applications, but you first have to run up some, um, uh, you have to create some infrastructure. You have to create a thing called a cluster. Um, and those are uh, a cluster of machines, EC2 machines that you, you own in your account. AWS Fargate, basically that's a service where you just give us your container and you can run it. And we basically manage all of the infrastructure underneath it. Um, AWS Fargate actually is a launch type of Amazon ECS. Um, the only drawback of Fargate is that you can only run Linux containers on it. You can't run Windows containers on it. Now we're using .NET Core for Linux, so that's fine. But the other two services, if you wanted to run Windows Docker containers, you could do that. Um, but we're not, we've got a, an ASP.NET application built in Linux. So we're gonna be just basically using uh, .NET Core for Linux. Now I'm gonna be using a thing called the um, Cloud Development Kit or the CDK to basically create some infrastructure for my um, container. I'm going to just send a tweet, which uh, sends you to a workshop if you're interested in how to do or use this CDK. So hopefully that uh, tweet is sent to you. I'm getting a response. Yes. Um, so first you have to install a, the C CDK. Um, now it's a it's actually built in javascript um so i use npm npm install globally the aws cdk locally on my machine and then once that's installed i can then start using cdk commands so i'm going to go and um, deploy and make a dotnet container so i'm going to create a dotnet application uh, create a docker image and then deploy it to fargate so uh in terminal i will create a, or make a directory Uh, call it Fargate demo. I'm going to cd into that uh, directory. Create a to-do list of things that I want to do. And then just open that up. Um, it's a markdown file, so it'll open it up in default in Rider. So I'm just gonna paste in um, 10 things that we're gonna be doing uh, in the next 10 or 15 minutes. I'm gonna create a sample app, a CDK application. <clears throat> gonna require us to add some NuGet packages, add a VPC, add a cluster, add a load balanced Fargate service, add a sample.NET application, create a Docker file. Um, we're gonna replace the basic Docker image that we create uh, in the first instance with this new .NET uh, Docker image. Then we're going to add a certificate and then we're going to add a custom URL and then we're ultimately going to delete everything. So um, first up, we're going to create a sample.NET uh, CDK application. So I'm going to just make a directory in my uh, demos uh, area called .NET. 
go into that .NET folder. I'm going to say CDK init sample app dash dash language C sharp. And that's going to create me a skeleton uh, application, which is here. Now, at the moment, I'm actually in the folder above. So I want to be inside of this .NET solution. So I'm just going to go and open that solution. Um, I reckon there's probably an easy way of doing this, but we're just going to CD into the CRS, CRC folder and then uh, just open .NET CLN. It's going to open up in another writer window. Now this is a, a, a CDK uh, application and I'm going to create a stack and it's got some like junk in here at the moment, which we just don't need at the moment. Um, basically creates a queue and a topic and a subscription. We don't need that. It's just like the hello world version of the CDK. The infrastructure, I showed you earlier how to build a, a, an S3 bucket. Now I'm going to build a, um, I'm going to build a container and uh, deploy a container using this CDK inside of Rider. So I'm just going to install some NuGet packages. Um, each service requires its own NuGet package. So I need one for uh, the Elastic Container Service. Install. And this Elastic Container Service patterns. Install that. And I think that's, we're good. And now we can start uh, creating our infrastructure. So we've created a sample CDK application. Good. We've added some NuGet packages. Good. Uh, next, we need to add a, a VPC. So a VPC is a, a virtual private cloud. And I want to say, I'm going to create this, this sort of space in AWS. Um, which spans three availability, availability, availability zones. I won't go into what they are. Think of them as sort of um, places to put your application. And then I'll create a, a, a cluster, uh, which is attached to that VPC. And you see, it's just a couple of lines of, of C-sharp code that I'm creating. And then I'm going to create this thing called an application load balanced service. Now, I basically set this up to point to that cluster. I say I want six containers. So I want six desired count, or I might say five. I want to use this particular container image. So this is a Docker container image coming from Docker Hub, uh, Amazon ECS sample. I want to give this the default memory limit. I want a public load balancer. <clears throat> OK, and what it's going to do is then go and create my uh, new uh, application load balance Fargate service with those service properties that we set up just above. So basically, it's going to create a Fargate service, which runs five containers, and they're going to be running that sample uh, Docker image, which is the Amazon-Amazon-ECS-sample Docker image. Um, now, if I just execute a command here in terminal, which says CDK synth, what that does is it, it generates the cloud formation template that needs to be deployed to actually generate that. So I wrote about, I don't know, 15 lines of code, uh, 37 lines of code. And this is the instruction set that all of that infrastructure requires to actually generate. So I would have to manually set this up in AWS. So it's creating a virtual private cloud. It's creating a sub subnets and um, a public private subnet, root tables, all the sort of infrastructure required to run a, a cluster. Um, we don't have to worry about any of that. It's using sensible defaults. So I'm just going to deploy it. So I say CDK deploy. And it will deploy it to the account that I'm logged into. I'm currently logged into my AWS account and the command line. And so it says, do you want to deploy these changes? I say yes. I'm going to be making some security changes. You might not have noticed it, but there were certain things that I were creating. It's giving me a list of those security changes that I'm making and, uh, and telling me uh, what those are. And then I've deployed them. I said yes to them. So now I've added my VPC, my virtual private cloud. I've added a thing called an ECS cluster, which is the thing which is my container is going to run on. I've added a load balance Fargate service. So next I need to go and create a sample .NET application. Um, now, as I said before, I'm going to be publishing, I've basically published a sample ECR uh, um, 
So if you go to Docker Hub, you can see Amazon slash uh, dash uh, Amazon ECR sample. You'll see it's a sample PHP application. Now we don't want PHP really, but it just goes to show that that's a Linux container running. Um, now there's a thing called the Amazon Elastic Container Registry or ECR. It's a bit like Docker Hub. It's exactly like Docker Hub, but it's just a private Docker Hub effectively. Now you could use Docker Hub if you want, or you could use ECR. When I'm using this CDK thing, it's gonna be uploading my container image to this ECR service. So if I go into the Elastic Container Service, uh, you'll see all of my basic containers that I've created in this particular region of here. So I've got one called Fallfat. Um, some of these are Linux containers, some of them are Windows containers, um, not important. And um, there's a one at the top here, um, CDK Assets. This is basically where it puts all of my um, container images. And if you're, if you want, you can just build Docker images locally, and then you can like push them up to the ECR in command line. Um, but, but basically we're doing this all with this, everything you're seeing here is kind of being done by the CDK for us automatically. But if you had a Docker image already, you could push it to this ECR system yourself um, and upload it there. Um, or you could just deploy it directly from Docker Hub or however you, however you wish. Now, instead of pointing to the PHP sample application, you just point to your container. Um, but I don't want to do any of that. What I want to do is just build a sample application and let the CDK do the upload for me and all the Docker stuff for me. And so uh, that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to go into, whilst that's, um, you'll see if I click on the, uh, the URL, we've got the sample PHP application. It's live. Under the hood there, there are six containers which are running under a load balancer. That's the load balancer URL there. Um, I want to then create a .NET application. Instead of hosting that, that PHP application, I want to host a .NET one. So let's uh, create a sample .NET application. So over here, Uh, just using .NET new, so this is like the .NET CLI, .NET new web app, and that's uh, just going to put it into a, a folder called website. Okay, now we have our sample website. So if I go into the uh, website folder, and then. Um, I want to basically don't want to care about editing this or anything. I just want to create a uh, make this Dockerized. So I'm just going to touch a Docker file or create a Docker file, and um, that's how you do it in uh, in Terminal. And then I'm going to open that Docker file uh, here, and then I'm just going to paste in um, some instructions. If you don't know much about Docker, don't worry. Um, neither do I. Um, but there's uh, this is basically the basics of how I would then go and build the application. It's a multi-stage build, Docker build. So it's going to create a container, do the build for me, then it's going to create a second release container, which is what we're actually going to deploy, and then it's going to ultimately execute .NET on the website .dll, which we create. So this is creating a, a, a Linux container, um, and um, that's basically in the root of that application. So what I can do is I can use uh, that the CDK is clever enough to, instead of me having to build that, upload it to Docker Hub or ECR, um, what I'll do is I can create a, get this the CDK to kind of upload it for me. So what we'll do is I create a, a task definition here. And instead of, what I do is I say, I want to try, create a container image from a website directory. So, a, a, sorry, a, a directory called website. And what that's going to do is going to, it basically, creates an image from a, an asset which is local on my machine. So I don't have to do any of the like the you know Docker build or anything like that. I'm just going to be doing it directly from my machine. It will be using Docker under the hood, but it's just kind of making it a little bit simpler. And then I take that Docker, that task definition, and I've added the container, I've added the port mapping, and I'm just going to change this, this, this code here. So instead of saying task image options, I'm going to say um, task definition equals this task definition we just set up there. So basically, this is like the container definition. We call it tasks in ECS, um, but they're the container definition. So now I've got that local folder. 
Now, when I say CDK deploy, the CDK is going to do some clever stuff. Oh, I'm in the wrong folder. Sorry, if I go to CD. Uh, there we go. So uh, CDK deploy, it's going to do a little bit more this time. It's not just going to go and uh, upload my infrastructure. It's also going to do a little bit of a Docker build beforehand and create a Docker container. Then it's going to upload that Docker container to ECR for me. And then it's going to publish my Fargate service. It's actually going to replace the existing Fargate service and switch out that. So you can see there's a Docker daemon running, doing my Docker build, creating my Docker container. And then it's ultimately publishing it to what I call uh, CloudFormation. You can see there's the uh, ECR asset that it's created. And we then have our uh, application created. I'm kind of running out of time, but I think we'll carry on for the next few things. So we've replaced, we've created the Docker file. We've replaced the Docker image with a task definition. Um, this one, okay. So very quickly, we'll just sort of look at the, the certificate aspect of it. So I want to um, not only um, go and deploy this, I, I kind of uh, want to create a, uh, a certificate and a URL for it as well. I don't want to just use the default URL. So um, whilst that's building, if we go over to uh, the console and look at a service called Certificate Manager, actually, we'll look at the CloudFormation first and just see look, that, that that's, the, that's the stack which is updating and it's kind of processing. You can you can look at what's actually happening in CloudFormation. Um, if you're familiar with these, you're, these are kind of like ARM templates, um, similar. So infrastructure as code sort of concept. Um, and you see stuff is deploying and, and various other things. You can see the template that I uploaded there and the change set, which has been created for me. Um, so let's look at Certificate Manager. Uh, okay. Certificate Manager over here. Um, so I've got a certificate, which has already been created for me um, for fargate.thebeebs.net, so an SSL certificate. Um, these are free in AWS. We don't use Let's Encrypt. It's, we, we basically sign them ourselves. We're Amazons are, are like a, a, able to do that. So we sign our own certificates, and any any services that you host on AWS can use our certificates. You can't download the certificate and use them elsewhere, but you, you can use them pretty much um, on something like an elastic load balancer, like we're going to be doing in a moment. So now my website is live. So that means that the Docker container has been replaced. Um, my, uh, so now it's looking at a .NET sample application, which is great. But I want to kind of update it. So um, we've got, uh, we've got um, the certificate added to it as well. So you can see now I've got my, my, if I go into the actual service on the console, you can see I've got the Fargate service and I've got my tasks running. And one, two, three, four, five, six. There's one of them is still a, a PHP. It's probably going to get recycled soon. And if we go down to the container that's running, we'll see that, yes, it's running the container inside of ECR rather than the PHP sample container, which it was running before. OK. Um, and we have our load balancer. And so it's created all this infrastructure for us. It's created this load balancer for us. It's it's created everything that we need um, to kind of uh, to to navigate and use this. But it's actually created lots of different infrastructure: a Fargate service, a load balancer, a VPC. It's created all of the subnets and all that stuff for us. Uh, we just basically issued a, a number of commands, and that's all we had to do. Um, okay. Now, I recognize that we're running out of time. Um, now, at the moment, it's deployed to that URL, but I'd really like it to go to fargate.thebeebs.net. Uh, uh, so um, inside that, uh, inside here, I'm just going to add a little bit extra code. I'm going to add a certificate. Now, I've, I've already got that certificate. I had that on before. 
So I've just pasted that certificate in there and it points to it points to that certificate that I've already created. I could create one actually, you know, from within uh, the CDK, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so you could do it from um, get a certificate from the ARN or uh, that's the like resource, uh, the URL to the resource is that ARN is like a specific thing in AWS, which basically a pointer to that resource. Um, but I could create a new um, certificate if I wanted to. Um, give this certificate a, a scope, an ID, and then create new certificate props. And then I could say, okay, I want a, a domain name, give it a domain name, and then that's what I want a certificate to be created for. But we don't need that because we've already got one created um, outside of the CDK. So I'm just going to point to one which has already been created. And then the other thing we're going to need to add, what's going on with that? Okay, that's back to normal. That's back to normal. We're just going to add the, the zone that we want it to be uh, running on. So what's the command? There we go. So fargate.thebeebs.net and then um, the hosted zone is thebeebs.net. So this is basically a thing called route 53, which is basically a URL service, um, which uh, means that it's going to upload the container and it's going to basically point the load balancer to my fargate.thebeebs um, domain. I'm using um, AWS to manage my domain. Um, so that's going to work. When I, when I do that, when I deploy it like that. So now if I do a CDK deploy, it's gonna do the same deployment, but it's gonna attach the certificate to my, uh, to my application and it's going to um, then deploy it. And, uh, and it's gonna also remove the port 80 uh, link. I only specified that I wanted port 443 open. So it's, uh, it's made that change as well. I could obviously modify that if I wanted to, but my website now is only gonna listen on port 443. So if you went to it on port 80, it would not work. Um, and it's going to attach the certificate to it as well. So that's kind of been deployed. And then Fargate.thebeebs is basically uh, working. So uh, now I have the Fargate.thebeebs is the output in the CDK. And if we go to that URL, it would uh, it would it'd be working. I'm running out of time, so I just want to be conscious of that. Um, now we've created this ECS container. Um, we've got this uh, cloud debugging feature in Rider. I won't have time to show you this, but basically, right, we could go into that um, ECR uh, container image. It's already live, and we could debug that application live. Not in it would be in production, as in we're going to be doing it in in the real live uh, ECR environment. But the idea is that you should not be doing this to production workloads because it does actually take them offline to set up the debugging. Um, but it's if you need, if you've got like a particular problem with uh, a container and you can't figure it out it's working locally, but when you put it in production, it doesn't work. You can use cloud debugging to sort of debug a container uh, locally. Um, I will send you. I am sending a tweet uh, now about that cloud debugging. And I will also send a tweet um, about a, a workshop that we have running online. If you're interested in, in learning some of the techniques, uh, going more deeply into some of the techniques that I've shown you today, um, then we have this modernization workshop, which basically takes an existing .NET application and modernizes it. Um, we look at RDS using SQL Server. We use the CDK to do stuff. We use things like Parameter Store to store our secrets and parameterize stuff for our parameters for our application. Um, we actually switch out SQL Server for uh, a thing called Aurora Postgres SQL, but still using Entity Framework. And uh, we add Docker support to your application and set up a CI CD pipeline. So if you're interested in that, there's the link, and I've um, tweeted that one out as well. Um, that's it for me. I'm pretty much bang on uh, 5.30. I'm not sure how questions will go, but I am open to them. If not, please just tweet me at the Beebs with any questions that you might have, and I'll answer them um, on my blog or I'll answer them over Twitter. Uh, depending on how complex they are. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Martin, for uh, for this session. Uh, there are a couple of questions that actually came in, uh, so let's uh, let's just go through it. 
I'm not sure if you're familiar with the uh, IDEA plugin for IntelliJ. Um, a little. Uh, do you know if the functionality is similar to the one that is available in Rider? Um, I, I, I believe that it's based upon um, serverless applications. So yeah, so it's using SAM in the background, but obviously it's we have these are these are for other languages. So, um, but they're similar. I use the Python one. Um, I've not used the Java one, but they're the same same concept. Yeah. So we have toolkits right. for other languages in uh, uh, these these plugins for other um, ones. All right, perfect. Then there's a couple of uh, more practical ones, I think. Uh, one is about someone who has an application that contains mixed services between some ASP.NET Core applications and some Lambdas. Uh, is there a way to test the entire application locally, connecting the Lambdas and the ASP.NET Core APIs locally? Uh, yeah, so you would um, you could run those locally. The SAM uh, application could run locally. Um, you just have to pass in the URLs, the local host URLs of where it's running locally, your ASP.NET Core application. So you could test the interactivity between your lambdas and your ASP.NET applications. Um, it would be a little bit more complicated to set up, but you would be basically using SAM to run the Lambda functions and then just running ASP.NET Core um, either in Docker or locally or however you want to do it. And then just connecting the two up uh, via via um, via a gateway. So I, yeah, you you could absolutely do that. Um, it wouldn't be completely straightforward though. Um, you'd have to do make sure that you'd, you'd be manually linking the services together. All right. And then there's uh, there's actually two more, but I'm gonna combine them into one because they actually uh, combine nicely. Um, right. It's around uh, having a way. Is there actually a way to define a threshold in Fargate, for example, so that it uh, prevents you from mistakenly having a while true somewhere in the application code and uh, paying a huge bill? And also, can yeah. we have a trial account for AWS? Uh, yeah. So in terms of, I would ordinarily absolutely give you all a trial account. Um, and if you just tweet me and DM me, um, I will send you a $50 uh, trial account, no problem. And if you need more, just DM me and tell me why, and I'll happily provide them to you. Um, uh, in terms of thresholds, yes. So you can set like a, a desired scale. So uh, this is true of Lambda and also of um, ECS. You can basically say you want the minimum number of containers you want, the maximum number of containers you want. Um, and basically, these obviously, these containers scale automatically. So depending on load, um, they will scale uh, between that those thresholds. Um, but you absolutely can have like a cutoff. I only want to scale to five or I only want to scale to 10 or however many you want to. Um, and that's true of uh, uh, of Lambda as well. Whilst they can auto scale, they don't auto scale indefinitely and infinitely. Um, also with billing with AWS, you can set up account um, um, alerts. So if ever you if you want to say, look, if I go over $40, on my account, then send me a text message and uh, um, and tell me about it. So uh, we we can alert you if so you don't get unexpected bills. And then lastly, if you do get an unexpected bill by something which is genuinely a dev or test thing, um, open us a support ticket and we'll refund you the money. If 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 you accidentally created stuff um, when you were trying stuff, then then please just open a support ticket. Say you were just practicing, you didn't mean to incur the cost. We have ways of making sure that it's not a production workload. And if we deem it that it was an accident, then we'll absolutely refund you. Okay. That's uh, that's super cool, actually. Yep. Thanks. No worries. Uh, all right. I guess that concludes the amount of questions that we had. Uh, if there's anything else, feel free to quickly send it now. Uh, if not, we'll switch over and uh, and wrap it up here. Let's give it a couple of seconds. No, nope, doesn't seem like it's all right. Then uh, let's switch over. Thanks again, Martin, for the for the session that you just gave, um, and actually learned a couple of things about AWS as well. So thanks. No worries. Thank you very much.